Genesis 4, verse 14. Our text starts in, in verse 17. We're going to pick it up a few verses. Actually, go back to, to verse 13. Genesis 4, 13. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Remember, the Lord had judged Cain for killing Abel. And Cain reacts and responds to that and says, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So that's where we left off two weeks ago at verse 16. So Cain, had, again, had killed his brother Abel. God had brought judgment upon him for his murder. And part of that judgment is the ground would yield for Cain even less than it had provi- would provide for Adam. And Cain would be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain complained about this judgment. God showed him mercy and put a, park on, a mark on him. Cain was concerned that someone's going to actually kill him as a result of what he had done and this judgment that was upon on him. So God puts a mark on him and promised to protect him. And so Cain goes away from the presence of the Lord, it says, and settled in the east of Eden in the land of Nod. The, the word Nod means wandering. And so we pick up our text for today at verse 17. It says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So if you read ahead in Genesis 5-4, it says, Adam had several sons and daughters. So Cain, obviously, if you think about who did Cain marry? I mean, who's on the earth at at this point in, in the creation story for him to marry? So he had to marry his sister. And so though later God would prohibit this in Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 27, this was long before God spoke the law to Moses. And here necessity demanded that Adam's son would marry his daughters. And at this point, the gene pool of humanity was pure enough to allow close marriage without harm from inbreeding. And it says, as Cain's descendants increase, he builds a city and names the city after his son Enoch. In verse 18, it says, To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered a Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So we observe a couple things from the genealogy of Cain that were given here. First, we see the first documented departure from the model of marriage that God had set up in Genesis chapter 2. What happens? We remember back in Genesis chapter 1, God had, fa- had fashioned one wife for Adam out of Adam's side. And he said in Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his mother, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One husband, one wife, one flesh. And now as sin has been introduced into the world, it isn't long until the marriage relationship becomes corrupted with Lamech taking two wives. And second here, we can see the rapid advancement of technology and the passing along of of trades from one generation to the next, from father to son. Jabal was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock, those who raise cattle. And Jubal was the father of those who play the lyre and the pipe. They were musicians. And Tubal Cain, the forger of all instruments of bronze 
and irons. These were the metallurgists and those who make metal instruments, whether of warfare or for farming. And so we start to see the development of a social structure here in which Cain's descendants, at least in part, are beginning to pursue different methods to earn a living. Not everyone became farmers. We see a beginning of a social structure where people are taking on different elements, different skills, and working in an environment of community together. In verse 23, Lamech says to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge, revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. The way Lamech boasted about his murder of another and the way he believed he could promise a greater retribution than God shows a progressive wickedness among humanity. Look at his attitude. We could see things quickly became worse with the human race, a true devolution. But for all of Lamech's boasting, neither he nor his descendants are ever heard from again in the Bible. He came to nothing. Verse 25, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So we know from what we read before in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam and Eve had many children who were not specifically named in the biblical record. But Seth was worthy of mention here because he was given to Eve in place of Abel and was the one to whom the promise of a deliverer from the seed of the woman would be passed. Seth appears to be the first child born to Adam and Eve after the death of Abel. Seth sounds like the Hebrew word for appointed. Eve says, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. So God had appointed another child for Adam and Eve to raise after the horrendous event that took place, which really resulted in them losing both of their children. One had died and the other was driven away into the wilderness to become a wanderer. But God does not forget Adam and Eve in their time of trial and suffering, in their loss. He blesses them with Seth and with more children. And it is obvious here that Eve does indeed recognize that Seth was a gift of God. We pick it up in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man... He made him in the likeness of God. Male and female he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. So as we review in chapters 1 through 4 Genesis, of Genesis, they, we are introduced to God, first of all, and then we're, who was there even before the beginning of creation. We witness the creation of the heavens and the earth and all that they contained. We saw how God created man and woman in a perfect environment for them to live. And in that environment, God created boundaries for them. Boundaries for their own protection. And one of those boundaries was willfully crossed, and sin and separation enter the world. Many theologians consider the books of Moses, and the Bible itself for that matter, to be a narrative, not just a historical record. It's a story. It's a factual story. And they are, in fact, the first factual narrative ever written, from which every other narrative or communication of a story is based today. And a narrative begins when something knocks life off balance. Life is now not the way it ought to be. And the, as the story proceeds, as the narrative proceeds... The plot thickens as central characters fight to restore the initial balance. There are always protagonist figures and forces struggling toward the restoration of that balance. 
as well as antagonist figures and forces struggling against the resolution and the restoration and against the protagonists. And finally, the story ends as the struggle results in either the restoration of the balance or the failure to restore the balance. Think about it. Just about any novel or movie follows that format. Characters are introduced. Something happens to knock life off balance for one or more of the characters. And then there are characters on both sides of this problem that struggle with each other while an effort is made to restore the balance. And the story either has a happy ending when the balance is restored or a not-so-happy ending with lessons learned and life going on. So it says, as it says here in the beginning of chapter 5, this is a book, a factual narrative. And God wrote this first narrative, and we've seen how life now has gotten off balance. And now the remainder of the book, the remainder of the entire book, will involve protagonist figures and forces and antagonist figures and forces struggling against each other to restore the balance. And in, in this narrative, just as it, seem, as the, it seems as if there's no hope of mankind ever being able to bring restoration, restoration there is what Tolkien calls the turn. The turn is present in all good narratives. It is a reversal, an upending of normal expectations, and a sudden plot resolution that is counterintuitive and satisfying. In this story, this is where the person of work and work of Christ are brought to bear on the problem. And he is proclaimed as the unique solution to the issue, unlike anything the world has to give. And now as a part of that narrative in chapter 5, Moses is going to take us from Adam all the way to Noah. This is kind of like that graphic that comes up during the movie, when you're watching a movie and it says, one year later, except this graphic comes up and says, about 900 years later. And so we need to keep in mind, we're going to read through a lot of genealogy here. And we need to keep in mind that we can arrange the following genealogies in a sequential manner and chart out a timeline. But we cannot establish an absolutely reliable timeline with this method. Because biblical genealogies are not always complete. Sometimes generations are skipped. But if we were to take these genealogies of not having skipped any generations, Adam's son Seth, who we just talked about, who was the replacement for Abel, Adam's son, Seth, was around for about 34 years after the birth of Noah. It's interesting, because they lived so long during that time. So Adam's son, Seth, would have lived 34 years into the life of Noah. And it's amazing to me as we read through this that because he would have potentially been alive during that time, it's possible that Seth could have babysat Noah when he was a teenager. And Noah could have taught Seth how to adjust the settings on his cell phone, like our teenagers do for us. So let's go through these generations from Adam to Noah. In verse 3, it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, And he died. So Adam fathered Seth, his third son, when he was 130 years old. And it says that Seth was made in Adam's likeness. And we know that from the Bible it says Adam was made in the image of God. And the same could be said of all of us. For we have all descended from Adam, and therefore we are all in his likeness as well. And it also says that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. And well, as we said earlier, they would have had to, for any more generations to come, right? They would have had to have sons and daughters, and they would have had to intermarry and have families of their own. As we said before, it does sound a little creepy, but at this early point, brothers and sisters were getting married and having families. 
God later, as we mentioned, would prohibit this when he gave the law to Moses, but at this point in time, it was necessary. Verse 6, it says, When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And when Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahaliel. Mahalalel. 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 <laughs> Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. And when Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And when Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the data, days of Enoch were 365 years. In verse 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So here with the mention of Enoch and Methuselah, we have something interesting that comes up. Verse 21, first of all, says that Enoch lived 65 years and then he fathers Methuselah. And then verse 22 seems to indicate that something happened to Enoch around the time of Methuselah's birth. It says that Enoch walked with God after that. Verse 22 says Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. 300 years. And had other sons and daughters. So there's something special about Enoch here worth mentioning in this genealogy and what a cool thing to be remembered for. It says, Enoch walked with God. What a great thing to have on your tombstone or as a remembrance of you is that Enoch, like Enoch, Enoch walked with God. And an even cooler thing is that Enoch is one of the few characters in the Bible that did not taste death. In verse 25, it says that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So one minute he was, and the next minute he was not. He was not there. And the narrative here doesn't tell us why, but Enoch got an early preview of the rapture. He is also listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, verse 5, where it says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, but he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And the, Jew, the book of Jude also mentions Enoch and tells us that Enoch was a prophet of God. Verse 25 tells us when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah for 969 years, and he died. So Methuselah has the honor of having the longest lifespan on record. That is a long time. Had Methuselah lived in more recent times, he would have been able to witness the Battle of Hastings, in which William the Conqueror conquered Britain in 1066, and would still be alive today to tell us all about it. It's crazy. He would have witnessed the invention of the sundial and the eye watch. Verse 28, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief. From our work, Relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. 
Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And after Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Lamech and his wife give birth to little Noah. And there was something special about Noah as well. Lamech had hoped that his son Noah, as we talked about during communion, would bring relief or rest from their work or painful toil. Noah's name in Hebrew sounds like the word rest. Lamech had held out hope that his son would bring them rest and relief from the painful toil of providing for themselves from the earth that had been, excuse me, cursed. And we see here in verse 32, Noah and his wife, as many people do, decided to wait a little while before they had children. Actually, God had them wait a little while. And so, after five centuries or so, God felt that they were ready for the scampering of feet across their floors. I'm not sure that's long enough. (laughs) Chapter 6. See, we're going through a lot for me, aren't we? This is a lot of text. Chapter 6, verse 1. When a man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. And the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So this is kind of an interesting passage. It seems that during this time frame, as the population of mankind expanded on the earth, the sons of God, whoever they are, saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And so as we dig into this to try to understand who are these sons of God and who are these daughters of man. There's, there's a couple views, primarily, of who, who we're talking about here. Some commentators believe that this is actually described intimate relations between the descendants of Seth, who were the sons of God, with the sons of Cain, who had been kind of banished away from the presence of the Lord. They, as that population increased, They say it was inevitable that these two clans would eventually meet and intermarry. They say this is kind of the sons of evil with the sons of good. And that Satan used this to to try to corrupt the descendants of, and and successfully corrupt the descendants of Seth. But it doesn't seem to satisfactorily explain what is said about the the progeny, the descendants, in verse 4, in which there is something extraordinary about the children that were produced from these marriages. They are referred to as Nephilim, the giants. And it indicates that they were mighty men, men of renown. And also, if we turn to Judah, the book of Judah, in verses 5 to 7, there seems to be a mention of this time period that gives us a little more information as to who they might be. So in Jude, verse 5, it says, Now I want to remind you, Although you fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved, I, my printer messed up this morning. I was reading. It. Let, me, let me get there. Although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, the angels who did not stay in their own position of authority, and blasphemed, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment 
of eternal fire. So Jude indicates that there were angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling And, and then after judgment, he's kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness. So it seems like this was obviously a dark time. Man had fallen in the garden. Death had been introduced into the world. And now it would seem demonic spiritual beings we're having relations with women. This was after the fall of Satan. Because we saw in his wickedness, he in his wickedness, he lured Eve into eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so he believed that these were demonic beings who come, came down and had taken the form of man somehow, and the earthly women were entering into earthly relations with them. These guys obviously were not like the other guys. And at, one, at once had been a perfect world was now unraveling quickly due to sin. And what does the Lord say in response to all that? My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. And again, there's two views on this verse. Something this is God actually putting a limit on the lifespan of man. In fact, the New Living Translation actually translates it this way. But other commentators, Guzik and Wiersbe, just to name two, believe that this is God actually starting the clock on the judgment that he would bring to pass through the flood. 120 years from now, this is all going to end. He says he will not contend or strive with man forever. So he's indicating that here that the flood would come in 120 years. Either way, God is clearly not pleased with what is going on in his creation. Verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's quite a statement, isn't it? Read that again. The wickedness of man was great, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I've got four things underlined there. The wickedness was great. Every intention, only evil, continually. So in about 900 years, we've gone from a perfect environment and a perfect relationship between man and his creator. Before the fall, they were in Perfect communion with the Lord, Adam and Eve. And though they were created with the capacity and freedom to sin. And now God, as He looks at the crown of His creation, which He created in His image, what does He see? Complete and utter wickedness. This wasn't just regular wickedness. This was wicked wickedness, as we would say in New England. Man had taken the fall to a whole new lower level. Verse 6, it says, And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Isn't that interesting? This is another interesting verse that comes up in this section. David Guzik observes, God's sorrow at man and the grief in his heart are striking. This does not mean that, God, that creation was out of control, nor does it mean that God hoped for something better, but was unable to achieve it. It doesn't mean that. God knew all along this was what, how things would turn out. But our text tells us loud and clear that as God sees his plan for the ages unfold, it affects him. God is not unfeeling in the face of human sin and rebellion. It's a little like when we know something that our kids are about to do is going to turn out badly. But they insist on doing it. So we allow it to go forward, hoping that there will be a lesson learned from it. 
But when it does eventually go bad, as we know it will, we, weren't, we aren't detached from the pain and regret. We aren't surprised by it, but it's still painful to watch because we love them. So this seems to explain the emotions of God. You know, what God is feeling in verse 6, a very interesting look into how he feels as he watches things happen, watch this particular instance happen, and I think in our own lives, as God watches perhaps some of the, the improper decisions that we make that are out of his will. Verse 7, it says, So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord says, enough. Enough. He's going to blot out everything and start again. In his infinite wisdom, he has allowed mankind to chase their flesh to the point in which it just, just brings their destruction and the de- destruction of God's, the remainder of God's creation. The animals and the birds and the creeping things. And Jesus refers back to this time. In Matthew chapter 24, if you want to turn there. And Jesus refers to back to this time and also to the time we're in now, really. As the end is drawing near. Matthew 24, verse 37. Jesus says to his disciples, For as were the days of Noah, so will be, coming, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. In verse 39, it says, And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man. And so as we close this morning, we are living in a time which doesn't seem much different from what we're reading about now, does it? And yet, there is something different today. Because we are living on this side of the coming of Christ. God has sent His Son to redeem mankind from their sin. Our hearts are still desperately wicked, aren't they? But God allowed His Son to be blotted out on the cross, and He took took His Father's wrath for our wickedness upon Himself. And then he rose again to the right hand of the Father. And he's there interceding for us. And we as believers who have allowed that blood to wash away our sins, we have decided to allow him to give us a new life through his grace. We have been given the gift of a brand new beginning. Verse 8 says back in Genesis 6, it says, But Noah found favor, or grace is another way to translate that word. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found it. Noah didn't work up grace, but he found it. He didn't earn favor. He didn't earn grace. He found it. Or better, it found him. Didn't it? And thanks be to God, grace found me too. And I just had to say, yeah, I want to be found. I want the arms of God's grace to wrap around me too. And I pray that's true for everyone here this morning. Just say yes to the amazing grace of God and let him, as he did Noah and his family, give you a brand new beginning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this portion of your word, this narrative, this story that 
shows us how you continued to bring about redemption, to bring about the restoration of the balance that you created in the Garden of Eden. And Lord, as we read about all these generations and how the the earth descended into wickedness, it kind of reminds us in the world we live in today. But Lord, thank you so much that you gave us a Redeemer. As you brought Noah and his family out of that generation of wickedness and through the flood, you've done the same with us. Because you saved us from our sin. You saved us from our own wickedness. So Lord, as we celebrated earlier what you did on the cross, you humbled yourself and became man. And you walked with your disciples and taught them how to live and you taught them how to die. Die to their own flesh and live for you. And so, Lord, my prayer is this morning, as we read, having read these words, that it would renew in us a new desire to simply say yes. Yes to your grace. To open up our hearts and allow you to fill them. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to renew our sense of awe at how you have redeemed mankind and how you've redeemed each and every one of us. Because we didn't found you. If we didn't find you, you found us. And we just needed to consent to be loved. We just needed to be say yes. I want that grace. And Lord, as you poured that grace into us, my prayer is that you would as you fill us up with that living water, we would just fill up to overflowing and be able to pour out into others and share that with our neighbors. Lord, bless each and every one who is here this morning as they go out through those doors. I pray their hearts would be changed and filled with joy and we live out our lives in worship, in everything that we do. Jesus' name. Amen.